From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. You've heard the expression companion planting, as in what plants supposedly love growing alongside what other plants. But how many such pairings are folklore and how many stand up to research? In her new book, Plant Partners, Jessica Walliser looks at the scientific evidence and shares pairings that can help us minimize weeds or improve soil or attract needed pollinators or other beneficial insects. More in a moment, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon size plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Jessica Walliser is a horticulturist and self-described devoted bug lover who gardens near Pittsburgh. She's the author of the earlier books, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden and Good Bug, Bad Bug, and co-founder of the popular website, SavvyGardening.com. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Margaret. How are you? Okay. How is it in Pittsburgh? <laughs> it, it, well, surprisingly, it's actually sunny today. We have a little snow left on the ground, but I think within the next few days, it's going to melt. Okay. Spring is coming. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah. So I should say before we start that we'll have a book giveaway with the transcript of this show over on AwayToGarden.com. And congratulations on the book. And it's 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 science-based companion planting, and it seems like the logical subject for you after your previous books, both with bug in the titles. So I take it you're a bug and science nerd. <laughs> a total science nerd. And I would say original. My original geeking out was over plants, of course, having a degree in horticulture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my career initially was focused on plants. But what really ended up happening was I, I kind of think I missed my calling. And I think if I had known way back long ago that entomology was a career choice, I might have opted for that one because I, I truly find bugs now to just be so fascinating. They're so dynamic. Um, you know, their actions in the world and obviously in our gardens are um, just it's such an intimate world, and I think that we as gardeners often do the insect world disservice because we only think of them as pests or pollinators yes. when, in fact, they have so many roles to play in the landscape. So they excite me. I just I love learning about them, and I love reading research, and that's where all of this comes together to make this yeah. book. Well, and and I completely wholeheartedly agree, and they're my fascination in probably the last decade or so of my gardening career, um, sort of shifted from the plant focus to the bug <laughs> focus. Um, mm-hmm. You sound this diversity message at the start of this new book, and and then throughout the book, and at the end, you remind us about it, and, and you say it's an ecosystems-based approach to the landscape. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because when I first started to do the research on companion planting, you know, we always think of companion planting as being plant A with plant B, right? It's two plants put together. When the reality of it is the benefits that we're going to see from partnering plants to get together aren't necessarily always from plant A with plant B, right? It's more about increasing the overall diversity of the garden. And People speak to that a lot in their perennial bed plantings, maybe in, you know, like a naturalistic garden, but it also is a really big key to successfully growing a vegetable garden, that you're not just having monocultures with a big, long row of tomatoes or a big, long row of peppers, but instead you're you're mimicking 
a, a more of a wild ecosystem in that you're mixing a diversity of plants together. And when you do that, you end up with a whole host of benefits. So building that ecosystem, that biodiversity in the garden leads to a more stable environment that's more resistant to pest outbreaks. You have reduced weed pressure, reduced disease pressure. And as vegetable gardeners, those are all the things that we're looking for. Yes, indeed. Um, so you, obviously this uh, book is not the folklore version of companion planting. As you say, modern companion planting isn't about what plant loves growing next to what other plant. It's it's drawing conclusions based on research and on science. And is a lot of that research then being done in support of agriculture, in organic agriculture especially? Is that where it's coming from? It is, yeah. And that's when I really started to dive into it, because I knew there had to be research out there, right? I, I was really starting to dive into it. And what I discovered was that, yeah, it's out there, but they don't call it companion planting. And I think part of that is because of the bad reputation the term has, right? Like, it's got a, a reputation of being based in folklore and conjecture. And so the scientists don't want to use that term. So instead, they'll call it things like interplanting and intercropping, or in some cases, it's creating a polyculture or improving the diversity of the garden. But all of those things are, right, they're all companion planting right. in a way because they're putting, intentionally putting certain plants together to get or achieve a particular benefit. So right. when you look at the research, that's what it's talking about. And there are many, many studies out there um, that speak to all of this. And it was exciting to see. Now, you're right. They are done at agricultural research facilities and farms and things like that. They're not, most of them are not done in a home environment. So we do have to do a certain amount of assumptions that, okay, how is this going to translate to a home environment? But right now, this is the best science that we have available to us to use. Okay. So let's run through sort of the range of support services, so to speak, that well-chosen plants can provide for each other. And you kind of outline these early on in the book. Um, and you say like, plant A might provide food for plant B and so on and so forth. So sort of help us with the, you know, the top level of the types of services that plants can provide. Sure. So I basically have um, like seven main goals of partnering plants together. So there's seven benefits that we can get out of this. And the first one would be soil preparation and conditioning. And that's things like, you know, choosing uh, cover crops or, um, you know, plants that fix nitrogen and share it with other plants through the mycorrhizal network underground. And they can do that in a living state as well, while the two plants are living in the same space together. So we've got soil preparation and conditioning. We've got weed management which is using certain plants, uh, whether as a living mulch or, again, as a, um, like a cover crop to really help manage and control weeds. We've got pest management, which is the one that most people are familiar with, uh, with plant partnerships, and there's all different levels of that. We've got disease management, enhancing biological control, improving pollination, and then one that's a little more related to aesthetics than all the others, which is support, which is using one plant as a living trellis for another plant to climb. Oh, so mechanical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the, like I kind of break my own rule in that chapter because I promise at the beginning of the book that every partnership that I discuss in the book is going to be backed by some research, which there's a big bibliography in the back of the book that uh, shows you all those studies. But that is the one chapter where I don't have the research to back up because it is an aesthetic. It's, it's really how does it look and how does it save space in the garden? There's not a lot of research on that one chapter. Well, we'll let you off the hook for that, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a pass. Um, so, so I, with soil building and weed control, um, let's talk about some examples. And so, again, we understand that the studies are being done in agricultural settings and so forth, but you're a home gardener. And so as you sort of extrapolate and tell us, I mean, you can tell us what the big studies say, but also how you're using them at home. Um, because I, I, I saw, for instance, a picture, and I think it might have been at your garden, of your potatoes kind of interplanted with bush beans, or I think, and other, other, other such pairings. So tell us a little bit about some of these for soil building sure. and weed control. Yeah, so 
Well, there's a couple different techniques that we can use. One is uh, something called biodrilling, which is basically where you are using a plant to open up channels within the soil, which really allows the movement of nutrients and water and air down through the soil profile. Uh, I am a no-till gardener, so I don't ever turn over my vegetable garden at all because I do talk in the beginning of the book about how important that underground network of organisms is and how when we till and disturb the soil, we break that up. And we're, again, doing ourselves a disservice as vegetable gardeners to do that. So biodrilling, using crops with big, long, thick tap roots like forage radishes, uh, they open up those tunnels in the soil and really allow us to break up heavy clay soils. They change the way the soil aggregates. Uh, in a very positive way for the plants that get planted in that area than the following growing season. So that's one way. Um, The other way that we can do it is by using cover crops. So we're planting the cover crops in that garden area when the soil is otherwise empty, Um, you know, when the the plants, uh, that plant spacing is uh, not being used. So it might be things like uh, winter rye or oats or crimson clover. I know a lot of home gardeners shy away from the use of cover crops because maybe they had a bad experience of the cover crop, you know, reseeding and taking over the garden or being a big challenge. But that's really because they haven't done it right. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that, but cover crop cover cropping is an art, and it, you have to follow rules when you cover crop, or otherwise you do end up getting in trouble. So uh, in the book, I detail exactly how to do it the right way. And I always suggest that people start with oats because oats are winter killed very easily. So we can grow them as a nice late season cover crop, let them die in place over the winter. And then we actually plant down through that detrius. And then that makes like a nice mulch to help control weeds as well. And then the Mm. third way that we can use it for soil preparation is as nitrogen transfer in a living state, uh, which I sort of touched on in the last section that we discussed, where you're you're planting a leguminous plant next to another plant, and that leguminous plant will fix the nitrogen, and then actually through the mycorrhizal network uh, and through roots and the nodules naturally dying off, it will help feed the plants that are living nearby. You know, you you mentioned that you're a no-till vegetable gardener, and and then we just we're mentioning legumes and their ability to fix the nitrogen and so forth, those nodules on their roots. And I was all, I've always been surprised, whether people are till or no-till, that they plant peas and beans and then they pull them out at the end of the season. Right. <laughs> and so so it's like, well, but wait a minute. Well, isn't all that good stuff still on the roots? You know what I mean? To leave it underground? <laughs> It is. Um, yeah, I mean, some of it some of it does get shared while the plants are in a living state, yeah. and it's not a huge amount. I think there was one study that I looked at that it talked about that uh, it was like a 70% increase in ah. nitrogen t- being transferred uh, when there was a, a leguminous uh, plant interplanted with the regular crop. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but your best, if, if you're growing a leguminous crop, you're better off just cutting that plant off at its base at the end of the season and leaving the roots and the nodules intact within the soil where they can naturally decompose, break down, and release that nitrogen then into the soil right. and let the microbes process it. Right. Um, one, one sort of old school, you know, supposition, folklore thing, um, this misunderstanding, you know, many, quote, companion plants were things that had a strong smell and they were perceived... It was assumed that they were repelling the unwanted insects, for instance. But there was this fascinating aha in the book about that that's not really what they're doing after all, is it? Well, that's the, it, it seems that they, they haven't come, the science hasn't come out and said absolutely, but it's sure looking like the plants actually, we plant a companion plant, it's not the smell that's repelling the pest. What that, what that odor is doing, that volatile chemical is doing, is actually masking the host plants. So it's making it harder for that pest to hone in on its host plant. So, so pest insects, they find their host with a, a couple different cues. One can be a visual cue, right, where they actually see it and they recognize it as their host plant. And then another big way is through the volatile chemicals that plants produce or odors, right? Our noses are not sensitive enough to find them, but certainly an insect's antenna are. And so they will hone in on their host plant based on its odor. Well, if we plant certain companion plants that mask that odor, the pest is much less likely to be able to find their host. Huh. 
Interesting. So masking versus repelling may be one of the things that's going on there. Interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yep. And and also just the fact that you're creating a diverse environment. I mean, I don't know if you remember reading in the book that there's a the like a sidebar page that's different colored that talks about the appropriate and inappropriate landings theory. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like the bugs, the receptors on their feet. You know, they kind of they kind of quote unquote taste the plant when they land on it and especially ones that lay eggs on plants. And so they're looking for a particular taste through their feet in order to lay the egg. So this theory speaks to the fact that if we have a mixed garden environment, when a a pest lands on a plant to taste it, if it lands maybe three or four times on the same host plant, it's triggered. The egg laying behavior is triggered. The cue goes off and they're like, okay, this is the right place for me to be. And that's when they lay their eggs. They don't just land once and lay an egg, right? If you have a mixed garden environment where there are all these plants growing together, there's a greater chance that that pest is going to land on the cabbage leaf one time, and then the next time they'll land on a dill leaf, and then the next time they'll land on a basil leaf, and then the next time it'll be sweet alyssum. And so the cue isn't triggered for that egg-laying behavior. So that's mm-hmm. an interesting bunch of research going on in, in that as well. So another thing I loved, and this is something that I friends who are farmers have talked to me about is trap cropping. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about sort of pest control, the idea of luring the pests elsewhere, away from the main crop you want to protect and other tactics, you know, for dealing with like, uh uh-oh, flea beetles or squash bugs or, you know, so let's talk about some of the targeted, you know, um, well, first of all, what is that trap cropping, or I guess you also uh, mentioned there's such a thing as a banker plant. Um, Tell us a little bit about that tactic. Trap cropping is actually one of my favorite ways to help manage pests in my garden. And basically, you're using a sacrificial crop. I'm planting something with the purpose that I want the bugs to go to it. I want them to go over there, right, and leave the rest of my plants alone. So, for example, flea beetles are very problematic in my garden. They drive me bonkers and they don't really affect plants as much when the plants are older, but they can really do quite, you know, a bit of damage on young seedlings, especially my tomatoes and my eggplants. And they can really set them back in their growth and development and they they produce yields later and they're just not as healthy. So I always interplant my tomato plants with radish because flea beetles much prefer radish to the tomato plants. So when I do that, the radish become the sacrifice, right? And the the cool thing about radish is they're so darn tough that they still produce edible roots, right, even when they have a significant amount of flea beetle damage. But they leave my young tomato transplants alone when I do that. So there's lots of examples of trap crops. And another favorite of mine that I always do is um, uh, I always plant, if I have the space, I will plant a blue Hubbard squash in my vegetable garden because the Squash bugs and squash vine borers much prefer blue Hubbard squash to any of the other types of squashes that I plant. So they go over there and leave my more desired squash plants alone. Huh. It's funny. And I love you said sacrifice crop, but I love that you outsmarted them with the radishes because you got radishes anyway. <laughs> exactly. You got, you yeah. Got... <laughs> now, it's a little like so another one you can do for flea beetles. Another trap crop is, is pak choy. So Uh like those little miniature pak choy varieties, they're really good for it too, for boring away the flea beetles, but you know, they get pretty holy. And one of my favorite things with pak choy is that they, it looks so pretty on a plate, but if it's, you know, all torn to shreds from the flea beetles, that one doesn't look so hot. So that is one I don't harvest afterwards. Yeah. Um, Nasturtiums. And you mentioned sweet alyssum before, but nasturtiums show up in the book. Tell us about what do they do for you? They're, they seem to be in your, your sort of tool bag. Yeah, so there's one particular plant partnership that works wonderfully for nasturtiums, and I know that it's a pest that many gardeners face. So always interplant your zucchini plants or summer squash with nasturtiums because the nasturtiums help deter and limit the number of squash bugs that you find on the plants. And that was a really cool study that was um, out of Iowa State University where they looked at this, and they found that it was a great reduction in the number of squash bugs and certainly the damage from squash bugs as well. And, you know, nasturtiums are lovely, and they'll help, um, you know, enhance pollination as well. So not necessarily on your squash plants, but on other garden plants. So it's, it's a pretty cool combination. 
Huh. Um, any other ones? I mean, these are such great examples. And I'm like, I'm writing myself a note while you're speaking. It's like, I've got to order <laughs> nasturtium seeds. Oh my goodness. You know, I've got to get some radishes. Um, so other ones that are kind of, again, in that tool bag of yours that you like to have to diversify um, and add ecosystem services to your vegetable garden? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a gajillion of them, but I would say one that I, I sort of always talk about because it's one that is also fits in sort of the, the old school companion planting based on what loves what. People always talk about, oh, you have to put tomatoes and basil together, right? You have to plant these two plants together because they're great on the plate together, but they're also great in the garden and the basil will help deter pests and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a lot of that is not backed by science, but there is some that is backed by science and it's particular with the pest thrips. So if you have a big thrips problem in your with your tomato plants and also with your pepper plants, um, and we know thrips can do a real number, especially on peppers, you do want to interplant them with basil plants because there is some great research showing that growing those two in tandem with each other will help deter the thrips. So that's a oh. really good one. And that's, that's sort of a classic combination that has been proven to actually work. Mm-hmm. Um. What about the sweet alyssum? Now, the funny thing about that is you wouldn't think it, but it's in the cabbage family, isn't it? It is, yeah. But what's what's great about sweet alyssum and sort of the big uh, lettuce farms out on the West Coast, out in California, if you've ever driven through them, you you actually see that they have strips. Some of them, the organic ones, will have strips of sweet alyssum alternated with their strips of lettuce growing in their fields. And the, that's done in particular because sweet alyssum, it, it enhances the biological control of aphids, which are, you know, one of the main pests that feed on the lettuce crop, especially when we have them planted in big, long rows like that. Oh. So sweet alyssum is attractive for, uh, to your, your surfeit flies and to some of the species of parasitic wasps that use aphids to house and feed their developing young. So that's an excellent plant partnership that's really easy to employ in a home garden. Um, how did you, what are some of the tools that you would suggest for us as gardeners? Like I love bugguide.net, for instance, for learning to mm -hmm. ID bugs, insects. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the other tools that you think all gardeners should be using and know about like field guides or, you, you know, besides your books, which are great. I mean, any, any advice there? Because I think you just said, you just said thrips. And then you said, um, I forget what, what other kind of insect you just said. Uh, I felt like it was surfids maybe. Um, you know what I mean? Like people are, might be like, Ooh, what's that? I don't know what that is. I wouldn't recognize that. Yeah. So, so sites like what's that bug? Um, are really good. Obviously, your, um, you know, local extension office, that's a really good one, um, you know, where you can take a picture or send a picture. So we do oftentimes get some good ID from that as well. Um, I also find, like, I follow a lot of people on Facebook, like there's Confessions of a Bug Addict, the Caterpillar Lab, like I just... <laughs> Sort of, I'm always out there looking for folks to follow who will teach me something, uh, something interesting. And certainly with the internet being what it is, there's plenty of opportunity for you to just use your search engine and type in, you know, uh, black and red beetle on kale plants and come up with some photos and look at those photos and what does yours look like? And, oh, okay, well, maybe that's a harlequin bug. So now I know what it is and, and then what I can do about it right. from there. So right. yeah, the internet right. for, for all its curses also has a lot of blessings as well. <laughs> um, so as we wind down here, we have another minute or so. Do planting partnerships have any downsides? Like is there, can you have too much going on and there's, do you know what I mean? Can you overdo it? and it, it, too much competition or whatever? Do we have to keep that in mind? You do have to keep that in mind. You absolutely have to keep that in mind. And that is one of the biggest downsides of it is, is that there is potential for, for competition. But when, you, when I think about it, I always think about in terms of natural plant communities. Plants are not evenly spaced in a natural plant community, right? Things are messy. They're growing together. They're, they're intertwining with each other. And eventually, obviously, if it's like a perennial planting, you'll end up with dominant species and ones that are a little more recessive. You know, that's not going to happen so much in an annual vegetable garden. Um, but don't be afraid to put things closely together, but do it 
smartly as well. Like keep in mind, okay, I know this is going to get this big, so I should give it plenty of room for that to happen. Um, right. You know, if you're using cover crops, don't sow them too thickly. It's not a case of more is better, right? You want to make sure that you you sow them at the appropriate rate and you do it at the right time. So there's lots of advice in Plant Partners for doing all of that stuff properly, but there's also a section that does discuss the potential for competition and that some of these things, even though you're trying to create this diverse ecosystem, that some of them could yield a possible negative result. But, I mean, that happens in anything we do in the vegetable garden, right? Like, there's right, always going right. to be some bad that happened with the goods. Right. Well, <clears throat> the new book is Plant Partners. And thank you, Jessica Walser, for um, being here and sort of opening our eyes to this scientifically based version of an old idea and um and as i said we'll have a book giveaway with the transcript i'm so glad to speak to you it was my pleasure margaret thank you so much for the invitation programming and underwriting support from brushwood nursery for more than 20 years brushwood nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the united states with full gallon sized plant and free shipping their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis brushwoodnursery.com Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. And good to speak to all the rest of you again, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.